Hey guys, Coach Ben here, and you are listening to The Bench Cast. Thank you for listening, tuning in today. We got a good episode for you. We're talking about the biggest mistakes that we've made in lifting so far, our biggest failures, and how we learned from them as a result and gotten better. Because I put up a video earlier um, this week on the YouTube about failure can be the best thing for you sometimes. And how through our failures, we learned we get stronger as a result. And that was probably the best thing we could have done. Uh, I talked about some circumstances where I missed some big lifts. You know, I reflect that in training, got stronger, came back and nailed them. All right, so there's always something to be learned within our failures, and I think it's going to be a good opportunity today. We're going to lay it all out there, some of the biggest things that we've messed up on and how we learned as a result, and maybe you can take home some things today too and learn through our failures as well. And I, everyone that is on Instagram Live right now listening to this bench cast, I want you to comment up as well what are your biggest failures and how did you grow and learn from them as a result? And then we can all discuss that and uh, get better together. All right, so got small arm legs strong here on the bench cast. He's back yet again, so I'm going <laughs> to let him in the building. He's got his coffee in hand. What's going on with the cold brew? We got any new things we haven't sampled in a while? Yep, we got, we got a good sample coming out next week. It's going right, to be a good so time. We're hoping on the bench cast we can sample some of this coffee. Because we haven't sampled any since King Leo. His small arm here makes great cold brew coffee. And we learned today, you're in a Starbucks. They got the nitro cold brew out. That's real That's smooth. something, huh? That is real smooth. So I'm not like a huge nitro cold brew guy, but that's got to be like a Guinness creamy taste it, but it, coffee. Yeah, it's, um, it's a nitrogen infused cold brew. Comes out real smooth. Don't even need to add anything to it. You just drink it straight. So is there higher caffeine content in the nitro? Unfortunately, it's about the same. It's about the same? It's about the same. So we're not getting any extra benefit. We're just getting a creamier taste? Yep. Does it take away some of the bitterness of the coffee? A ton of the bitterness. So you're getting a nice, smooth nice, coffee taste. Smooth, delicious, coffee. Now, is this coffee. something I want to order without water, too, just because it's a cold brew and I want all the concentrate? No, you wouldn't have any water added to a nitro, just straight from the tap. All right. I'm sold. <laughs> Next time I'm getting myself a nitro cold brew. Pricing differences? Uh, probably more expensive. All right. Well, we'll debate about it then. <laughs> All right, guys. So I'm going to kick it off here. We're talking biggest mistakes that we've made. I'll, I'll kick it back old school on this one. This is before I even did a meet. All right. So this is in the lead up, actually, to my very first meet. And this one I still remember in my head because it was probably the most embarrassing fail that I've had. Uh, I had 270 on the bar. All right, I think I was going for, I don't even know if it was a max attempt that day, but this is a max. Um, so I guess, you know, it was a max attempt. But That's what it ended up being. <laughs> <laughs> I took out 270 on the bar. Back then, I didn't have much setup technique. I think it was like a close grip. I had a pretty close grip. I did like a thumb out from the smooth. Um, I was a little older guy though, but I missed this 270. I came down with it. I was like, training's been going well. You know, I've been doing Shaco. I don't even think this was during Shaco because you don't even handle these attempts. This was actually before, so this must have been early, early in the summer. Um, but I took out this 270. I felt good with it. I crunched that bar, uh, and I took that baby down. I was in Gold's gym. On one of those random ass benches, you know, nothing special, commercial gym bench. I get down to chest level, and then it hits me <laughs> that I realize this is not coming up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I go to press it, maybe halfway, if that, and then I'm struggling now. I'm struggling. I'm like, in my head, I didn't clip the bar. I know better. You don't clip the bar. It's your only escape route. All right. I know in my head, I'm in trouble. All right. Luckily... There's a few people in the gym. I didn't even have to make any noises. Oh, they... Someone came in and started running over there. They probably knew because back then I probably looked like an idiot. <laughs> so if you look like an idiot, they probably sense it, and then they're going to keep an eye on you. You know, I, right? I find if there's a little guy, loading up a bunch of weight on the bench press, everybody stares. 
Not necessarily. They think you can do it. They want to see the show go on. Yeah, and then hopefully you get a good Samaritan that wants to run over there and, and help your ass, or else you're just toast. <laughs> and it is a pretty humbling experience to tell you that. After that, uh, I just kind of wanted to leave. <laughs> I felt pretty embarrassed. You want to do the walk of shame out of the gym. Yeah. I did not want to lift the thing after that. But you know what I learned from that? Don't be afraid to get someone to help you with your max effort attempts. All right. First off, uh, you know, now now that I know better and, you know, I've been through the game for, for quite a while now, um, you know, I'm always preaching, even for warm-ups, make sure you get a handoff. Because that takeout process is so, so technical, and you want to be able to nail it down and practice getting into your lats. So, I mean, just for that fact alone, you should always get a handoff if you can. Uh, just ask anybody. You know, I, nowadays, I would, you wouldn't even give it a second thought. You wouldn't give a shit. You got to get somebody, find whoever, tell them you're helping me on the freaking bench right now. That's but, a good lesson. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask for help in all different phases. Um, and also, too, if you're going for a max... Make sure you got some kind of safety in place. God forbid, who knows what's going to happen. Even if you aren't, you are strong enough. Something happens. You know, you get injured. Um, don't leave it up to chance. So get someone. Make sure someone's there. If you have safety handles there, make sure the safeties are up. All right, got to have some kind of safety between you and the bar. I'm really big on that. Uh, I won't even attempt anything big unless I know someone's there. They have me. Safeties are up. Um, and don't clip your bar. I see beginners come in all the time and they try to clip the bench bar. First off, if you need to clip the bench bar, something's very wrong because that bar is tilting everywhere and weights actually have to slide. Um, that's more so a squat. Like when you're walking out of squat, you know those weights shift everywhere. A little bit, yep. But on a bench, if your weights are shifting everywhere, there's something very wrong with that. Um, first off, but then second, if you clip a bench, I remember Donnie Thompson telling us a story once. We came in for a seminar. Um, this guy in his garage down south, right? Hot day. His family's gone. He decides to bench alone, handling a good amount of weight. I think this is like 500, almost 600 pounds. He's in his garage benching, right? Um, granted, he didn't clip his bar, but the bar was rusty. So those weights weren't moving. Rusty weights, rusty, rusty bar, and, uh, that was the end of him. That weight came down, and uh, he could not slide that weight off, and that was the end of him. So that shit happens. That's a rough way to go. That shit happens, um, and I can only imagine the mess that created for everyone involved. So you don't want to be that. You, know, you don't want that happening to you. All right. Um, be smart with it. Always get someone to help you out. No bench is worth risking your life over. All right. In training, at least. <laughs> so, that was one I've learned from. I want to put out a shout-out to Tommy Matthews. Mm -hmm. His big training mistake was that he would focus less on working weak parts of his body and focus more on finding the perfect program. All right, so that that's a common one, too. Um, I know a lot of people try to neglect shoulders and attempt to get the big bench press. That's a big one. Yeah, and I think... I've been on record lately, and you've been around and saying uh, you don't need, like, any program works. Yep. You, know, you could get any program to work. We talked about that on the Benchcast not too long ago, uh, and that's coming from me who makes programs for people, too. I mean, you can spin it many different ways, and a lot of things work. And, you know, while some things can be better than others, it's really about the intensity that you're bringing to the session, all right? Uh, any program can get you some results if you bring the right intensity, the right mindset, um, and you spin it right, you know. So that's definitely a very good lesson. Uh, always make things harder. You know, you can – If you know what the key is? If you find a way to make lightweight feel harder through whatever the case may be. Uh, yesterday uh, in the gym I was having Kendall actually do top-end holds. And guys, if you've never done top-end holds on the bench – uh, it's a real eye-opening experience. So not only are you pausing on your chest, but when you go to finish that rep, now you're holding it three seconds or so up top. All right, you don't think anything of it. Usually we kind of just rush into the next one, but having to hold that weight, having to keep that leg drive, keep that positioning, very very tough on your legs. You have to really work with your lats, 
All right, you got to work very hard to keep control of that bar uh, and then reset and be ready for another rep. So I urge everyone to try those out. But great one from Tommy Matthews. Uh, if you have any others, guys, on the Instagram Live, anyone tuning in to the BenchCast, uh, we are talking about our biggest failures, how we've overcome them, and learned from them. And to add to the uh, don't clip your weight scenario, even if you do clip your weights, you're, like, you're a beginner lifter, you know, things aren't that heavy or whatever, you have to do the roll of shape to get out from the bar if no one's there to save yeah, you. Well, that's true. That's the only option at that point. That one's rough. I've, I've been there. I've had to do the roll of shape. I had to go all the way down to my waist. Yeah. You know, do the sit up up, and then you know that, that's worse. That's yeah. so much worse. You know, granted, you get heavy enough weight, that's gotta hurt right yeah. on your bladder. God forbid. Oh man, <laughs> I, that's one I have not done. At least <laughs> that I can remember. At least I had a safety rack so I could roll it on that. I've never had to roll it on my body, but uh, yeah, that you don't want to do that. Uh, I this is a big one for me. This is probably the biggest one. Is how many freaking times I failed with 315. Uh, that number, those three plates, you know, back back in the day, that would staple me every time. It was frustrating as shit. I would hit it off a board, miss it out of meat. Uh, I just could not break that plateau. And I went for a good, solid year straight without pushing past 315. I, it made me really start to hate benching, <laughs> believe it or not. Because I'd go in... I'd have a killer bench session. I think everything's going great. I'd be pushing out everything, and I just could not break this 315. But what I learned from that, a few different things. One is the perseverance that, you know, it, sometimes it takes time. It just does. Especially as you get stronger, it takes time to break these plateaus for whatever reason. you got to learn what connects with you, what you need to do next, and that just takes time. So you got to enjoy the process of training. I always tell everyone when they get frustrated like that, just start enjoying the process again. Just enjoy being in the gym. You know, either way, you're still getting health benefits out of the strength training. So just enjoy the, the process. Enjoy that it's a puzzle and that you're trying to figure it all out. All right. It's, it's not just you're not going to make progress meet to meet. It doesn't happen like that all the time. And if it does, then you're very, very fortunate. And that's why I'm always happy to take a five-pound gain out of meat. Yeah, I'm very happy for that to happen because I remember going a whole year just to get to 320. So I'll keep it in perspective. But the other thing I learned is what I was doing in my training. You know, one, I was training bench once a week. Because the program at the time uh, really only had benching once a week. And I figured, you know, that was good enough. But with bench, as we talked about, you just recover so much quicker. So, you know, I'll bench on Tuesday. By next Tuesday, I'm ready to go. I could already squeeze another bench session in there. You know, I, I was ready to go on Friday. But the way I was benching too, not just the volume or the frequency, it was the way I was benching, full setup. And I don't know if you ever seen videos of me benching back in the day, but I was toes back, extreme, extreme arch, hands as wide as they can go. I was the classic like Russian woman lifter that you see on these Instagrams with the crazy arches, you know, that was pretty much me. I was just trying to get as much out of the range of motion as I can. Not necessarily a bad thing, but the majority of my training was that, all right? I mean, the range of motion, if I was to show you, if you can see this on YouTube, um, we're like talking like an inch. It was retarded, you know? <laughs> it was like, I didn't even have to press the bar. It was it was down, I get the leg pop, it was up. You know, I felt like there was zero strength component and all momentum and shit. And uh, I was doing this every single week, once a week. Granted, I had some fantastic training sessions, but thinking back on that, I wasn't training anything. I didn't get a chest pump. I didn't get a tricep pump. You know, I really was probably doing enough accessories to make up for that. I was getting great technique practice, but what's that worth if you're not getting stronger? So I figured that shit out. A lot of, um, two interning with some strength conditioning facilities, seeing these football guys, and these guys kept getting stronger, and they're just getting on the bench, laying flat, gunslinging weight. <laughs> so I'm like, well, what the hell? So I start doing flat stuff. I had to take a huge step back. I could not even handle close to the 300s, doing like feet up, flat back type stuff. But I hammered that, and granted, it got me stronger. All right, and I, I tried a lot of different stuff. I totally took out the technique. Right, I just did more flat back, long range of motion pressing, and it was humbling. You had to drop weight, 
Uh, I made things harder. I paused longer. But that's what broke me through that and kept me climbing. So that was a huge one. I learned a lot from that struggle of 315. And that was a rewarding experience. You know, now looking back on it, I'm not mad about it. I'm just happy I went through that because I could take it into the future. So when you're stuck in that moment, yes, it's frustrating. But in this sport, you got to think long game. It's got to be long game. If nothing is in the immediate, you know, you got to be thinking 10 years down the road. And that's how you become a good lifter keeping yourself healthy for a very long time, going through those struggles, and just working at it. It's a real good lesson right there. Absolutely. Patience. Patience is key, especially in strength. Yes, it is. We got anything coming in on the Instagram we, live? We got Hercules Strong with a question about programming. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, how can we incorporate your programming into what his coach does for him? All right, well, um, what type of program are we talking about just a bench program here let's get a little more information on that I do have a bench template called the second day or the second bench day solution okay and this one in that program I actually have five different layouts and it's all planned around what you're currently doing in your training and how you can add more bench volume so the classic example, 531, one bench day a week, really. That second bench day solution template, I added that in as a way to add more volume to a current program you're running. And in that, I also give suggestions of what you're currently doing, what you should choose out of that template. So there's actually five different things you can do, and it's all based around what you're currently doing. So I usually recommend someone check that out and that's not one of our most popular programs. It's actually our cheapest one and one that I find to be extremely valuable because you don't have to change what you're doing. It's just a way to add more to what you're doing. So I wish people saw more to value in that and that's more on me is, is getting that out there and, and explain to people that's what it is. But uh, that second bench day solution template uh, is very, very, very valuable. Then I think we got a big lesson from a very successful lifter from uh, Dave Kingwater. I bombed out of a big meet earlier this year. I have been in the game a long time and have always thought I had all the answers. I realized that the hardest thing to do is to analyze yourself. That after watching all your videos, I realized that I was forgetting the basics, which is a real, real key here. And his mistake was not having a coach each and every workout. Absolutely, I think that's a great lesson for everyone. Is It's very tough to be real with yourself sometimes. You know, myself included. You know, I need other pairs of eyes on me. There's lots of eye-opening experiences. I was just showing you the video of a recent meet uh, that I did, and the weight was totally off. I was very, very surprised that it looked that off, and that's something that concerns me because I never really noticed that before. The thing is, when you're lifting yourself, and if you got to make sure you have an experienced pair of eyes or a way to self-analyze yourself. That's why video is so great. Otherwise, I wouldn't even know. All right, so people I train with, they might not really pick up on it. I might not be picking up on it because what I'm feeling, I see a lot of times in gym, um, some lifters, I see them benching like this. Oh, yeah. I saw this the other day. Right uh, elbow is like tucked to the side, left elbow is up like this. Bar's coming up crooked. Feel, yeah, he didn't feel anything wrong with that. Which is very concerning to me, because I would, I, I imagine I would feel something like that, but we don't always feel that stuff. So that's why video is such a great tool, having a coach uh, to point out those small things. Um, I can't tell you how many times someone sent me a video, and you know, at first glance you think it's all um, set in place, everything's good, but I like to break it down. I, I really take the time to look through video. You know, I don't just skimp over it I, I look at the foundation up and you always want to take it from the foundation up like he said the basics right how you're setting up that pinch and tuck the slide back how does that look getting the feet down are you keeping tension there um, are you keeping tension as you grab up to the bar like what are you prioritizing there so much stuff into the setup uh, where are your feet how are your toes look you got the hip activation and then taking the bar out, it is just so, so much 
little details that go into all that. And you got to take it from the ground up. You can't look at it from what's happening during the press because by that time it's too late. Like at the bench clinics, um, you know, we only touch on setup and takeout really. There's nothing really to talk about when you're pressing the bar because we've already covered it in the setup and takeout. You should I, already look good. The setup is the longest portion of the bench clinic. Yeah, I mean, you, you filmed them. Um, we don't even have people handle weight anymore. It's just you set up. We'll go over takeout, but then everyone's going to be spot on. I tell you, if I gave them a bar with weight by then, they're all spot on. They're all good to go. Just know where to all touch, right. you're good. I think that's a big lesson is to go back to the basics, especially when you get frustrated with trading, frustrated with programming. Because as you go on, as you get more advanced, you try to add in some secret exercise, secret sauce, try to get you up. But sometimes just going back to the basics, setting up, you know, just pinch and tuck, slide back, going back to what got you there will propel you forward. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll do the same thing. After every meet, um, I'll go back to handle them very lightweight and I'll really pay attention to what's going on during my setup. The thing that I find I fall out of tune with most often is during the takeout phase of getting into my lats correctly and having that bar really sink down. And it's just a really fine line between staying in your shoulders too much and really allowing the lats to take the brunt of that weight, um, settling the weight. That's usually the thing that I find most often I'll fall out of tune with very quickly and that I have to keep going back to and getting better with. But I'll tell you, leading up to a meet, I used to feel like I needed like six sessions in the shirt. This prior meet um, with the shirt I actually hit attempts in, I used once. I used it once. I felt good with it. I was training with the other shirt the whole time. It did not go well at all. Um, but I didn't get nervous from that. We'll touch on that. That's something I wanted to touch on. But uh, with my other shirt, I just feel so confident and dialed in with that thing that I used it once. Hit a couple good lifts. That was enough to tell me I'm good to go. And I, I only need that one session really at this point because over the years – uh, I've gotten familiar with just all the technique practice you already have to build upon that base. yeah just layering it up but it's I'll tell you not only when you are looking good not only do you need a, a coach when you aren't looking good but you, when you are looking good you need a coach to make sure you don't fall out of groove all right because that happens very quickly and it snowballs just the momentum that you get just gets completely out of control absolutely one of the training mistakes I made in pursuit of the 500 deadlift many years back was I was so close. I was at 475 for so long. I would always want to test 500. I would always want to just throw the plates on. Like I was just yeah. so close. Like every other week, I was maxing out. Always trying to max. Always trying to we, max out. And then we touched on that um, programming episode a couple of weeks back. Make sure you guys check that out. That was a great one. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Testing. We we talked. I think we said every three four months is usually when I'll do that. Um, raw, I like test once a year. Yep. You know, but um, there's ways to do it without taking a max too. So say you hit four seventy five for two. Yep. Just rep PRs along the way. Yeah. Those will be huge. Yeah. How the weight moves, feels. You know, four seventy five moves faster than it did then. There you go. If you have a speed reader, so you can like act actual data too, that's key. I think we should do an episode on that. I think that's a very valuable tool. Speed and reps? I want to get my hands on one of those. Yeah, the velocity. The velo oh. it's, it's unique to the person, yep. but it's a very good feedback Once tool. Once you build your own profile, you're yes. good to go. It's a very good feedback tool. It's definitely a lot better than the RPE style. Yeah. No, you can tell like how on you are that day. A lot with the speed of the bar, and that's why I always tell everyone from warm ups on throw that thing, throw that thing through the roof, always 100% intent, explode into it because you are getting a training benefit. All right, so to move on, um, talked on some early failures of mine. Another early one when I was first training in the shirt or doing a meet in the shirt. Funny story my first meet in the shirt, um, I actually had the shirt blow up. All right, and I didn't, I didn't really know anything was going on, um, and I dried my shirt because it was a little loose. I put it in the dryer, uh, which I don't, I think that's not an uncommon thing, but I put it just in just dry, and after that, it did not quite feel the same, and that thing just snapped completely, <laughs> you know, a lesson in shirt care, but... 
that thing 450 and it sucked too because my first two were not grouped well they were swinging a little bit got the lift but 450 i felt dialed in that thing was coming down i was like this thing's gonna explode off my chest and it instead, sure did it exploded into my <laughs> chest <laughs> but uh i learned that lesson uh don't mess with your shirts in weird ways before the meet <laughs> um but yeah, that was that was a pretty, pretty crazy day. But, to expand uh, on that one too, don't do something crazy before your meet either. Yeah, like you're not gonna get stronger in like the two three week period leading up to your meet. You can only mess yourself up. Yeah, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, I don't even train in a shirt really, three four weeks before the meet. Let yourself recover. Technique is what it is. You're not really gonna get stronger. You're gonna get stronger from recovering. I guess a good way to look at it. That's how you're going to get stronger in that period. Um, my first multiply me ever, I bombed on the bench. We've talked about that. Um, that was a rough one. But, you know, I ate my humble pie and I left. That was it. Got back to training. Um, but that was a really tough one because I wanted, I've been wanting to do the Arnold Main Sage Bench Bash for a long time. You know, if, if it was, uh, if the cards fell right, I would have tried doing that two, three years earlier, but they never really worked out for me. Uh, that 550 I needed, I guess, for the qualifier mount. And uh, in training, I was hitting you know, upwards 600, but I cut 27 pounds. <laughs> that changes things quite a bit. Um, felt great in the squats, went three for three, but upper body, I guess, just not, didn't fill out and I got nothing out of the shirt. I actually hit the last one, but the butt came up a little bit, so I learned that was the last time my butt ever came up at a meet. Um, so I learned from that too that I need to tuck back how leg drive works and um, how to how the shirt's gonna work with 27 pound cut. Not well. Next two, <laughs> well the next I got it pinched in the next two 27 pound cuts because I did do it two more times. Uh, it ended up working out. I ended up hitting 590 at the Arnie, but I learned from that 550 bomb. Those are when you went from uh, to 198, right? Yes. Yeah, I was uh, 224. Down to 198. Something like that. It's impressive. Yeah, 26, <laughs> 27 pounds. Yeah, it's a whole process. We can delve on that another time, too. But, um, yeah, I'm done with that. The uh, During that same time, training for the Army, 700 failed squat. We're getting all our failures out there. What I learned from that, um, in training, I try to take 700 on the squat and I got down with that weight and right around mid range on the D set I started shaking like a leaf. I was going back and forth. It looked like a convulsion. <laughs> and that's I kinda of fell out of groove and I had to dump the seven. That was the first time taking a straight weight. That pissed me off. That whole training cycle I was on. I knew how I was competing with. Um I just brought it every training session. I was just training on a mission. I was I'm going to the army I'm training on a mission. But missing a lift like that pissed me off. So that was like, this shit's not happening again. I hammered so much core training. Everything after that was abs, pause squats with bands around my knees, all this hip stuff. I came back a few weeks later, crushed that 700, and took like 750 in the bands. So just pushing yourself and just training with intent. I hit everything I had to. I knew my core was weak. You know, my hips were weak. I shouldn't be shaking like that. I went and I fixed it. I hammered it in training uh, relentlessly. <clears throat> that pissed me off. And those are things that you can hide and cover up on like submaximal weight too. Like you're not yeah. going to see that necessarily on oh, film you, or anywhere. No, not at all. Submax weight, yeah. Speed work, dialed in. But when it was the heavy weight, exposes you. That pissed me off. So I attacked it. But I learned from it. I didn't let it get to me too much sometimes missing the left just like makes you so angry you just hit the next one too yeah because like I, I, you were with me when i failed 495 on a max day for deadlifts <laughs> that was weird that was weird and you know what my next tenth was i loaded it up and did 525 butter yeah that was weird yeah it pissed and it me didn't off didn't even look technical yeah but the thing with the deadlift too is you gotta it's the only lift without an eccentric <clears throat> so you have to all of a sudden with everything in your body, explode 100% into this dead weight on the floor. You got to bring it. Yeah. It's just, you got to have a whole different type of mindset. Because it's not like you're unracking the bar and you're like, oh shit, this is heavy. And know how much to dial in. 
You got to be 100% with no feedback, just off the floor explode. So it's very, very different. So sometimes just how engaged you are with that bar, you know, it's a big deal in the deadlift. Um, same same meat too. Uh, I kept failing the 600-pound deadlift. I could not, my grip, my grip, and I never had grip issue. And then all of a sudden, 600 exposes you. Yep. Kept falling out of my hands, and that pissed me off. <laughs> that pissed me off. I would go into the gym, and I would do grip work. I would go right in the morning, grip work, grip work. I'd be hanging off things. I did everything to work my grip. Um, yeah, that pissed me off. <laughs> but I ended up with 580 at the meet, so I didn't really get a chance to take it anyway. Um, 700. First time I failed 700 on the bench. All right, that was in October last year, and it pissed me off because <laughs> I had 700 right near the top. It was a great press up, and I just could not get the lock long enough. Drifted on me a bit and missed the lift. But what did I learn from that? My lockout needed some work because that wasn't the only time I had some lockout issues. Those top-end holds, nailed those in training. We talked about that earlier. Those top-end hold lifts. Great, great stuff, guys. Please throw them into your training. It's going to be very valuable. Especially if you're a shirted lifter, throw them in. It's a must. Just hold the weight longer. Even raw, just hold the weight longer. All right? It does a lot for you. You know, you don't have to go through the pressures. Hold that weight. You know, you know, Jen Thompson does those crazy 500 pound holds and stuff. You're getting a lot out of holding the weight and just applying leg drive and, and just staying static with it. But do that in your training, those top end holds. I did all this lockout work, floor press with the chains, uh, pin press, the board pressing. Uh, I did all that stuff. I worked more with 700s. And at the Arnie, like I said, granted that 705 didn't come down so smooth. Uh, I locked that sucker out, and I would have held it there that whole time. I was not letting up that lockout. That shit was locked. All right, so... I learned from that 700. I needed a lockout help. I crushed it in training, and then there you go. I hit it when I needed it, but I learned from that. So that was actually a very good thing. Just always something to learn to the failures. We got anything coming in? You got something you want to share? I got one real quick. So in my uh, pursuit of the deadlift, I ignored everything else. I was like, all right, we're going to bench some time. But that extra squat day, that can be used for deadlift assistance work. I didn't think of the squat to build my deadlift. And I was stuck. I could not move past 450. So I took the deadlift back. I lowered it to under 400, 385 max. And I added in two squat days instead. And that, I feel, was what helped catapult me into the 500s. Yeah. And it's those little things you don't think of, like, um, you know, a wide stance squat. It could build a sumo deadlift. A huge carry and, and all that vice versa stuff. You know, uh, they all play into each other. You just got to find what gets you up there. Yep. You know what I mean? Like the overhead press for me on the bench. I talked about how valuable that is. Um, when you suck at overhead pressing, I'm telling you, if you get that overhead press up, the standing barbell overhead press, if you know you suck at it, get that up. It will do wonders for your benching. All right. That especially helped me. Anytime, any, like I hit 240 was a PR for me on the overhead this past training cycle. And I, I've pushed in a new territory with my bench. Every single time, I get stronger on the bench. If that overhead goes up, I get stronger on the bench. So why keep trying to train the bench so hard when I can just get my overhead up and do everything for that? Because the bench goes up as a result. So I'll just things play into each other like that. All right, so I got one more that I really want to touch on. And then if anyone has any comments on Instagram Live, love hearing from you. Uh, we're talking failures and how we've learned from them. We've had some really good ones so far that we can all take home a good message from. Uh, so, 750, this past me. All right, it was a shot in the dark. First off, I didn't know how I was going to go. Training went horrible at 750. <laughs> um, granted, at first in this new shirt, very, very tight. I just kept throwing on weight. First two sessions in it, throwing on weight and feeling fantastic. But everyone feels fantastic to the high boards all right and a one board i would consider high for me i don't have much range of motion uh, a one, there's a big difference once you go under a one board 
Uh, I smoked 750 off the one board. Felt fantastic. It even warranted me thinking I could do 775 or 800 the next session. Well, that didn't quite work out as planned. Uh, I took 750. I was thinking it would go to my chest, but not close. Couldn't touch in it. Uh, realized I needed more weight. Tried 800. <laughs> that just came down. But that was probably one of the most valuable things I did because after holding 800, I'll tell you, everything was light. And then you're thinking in your head, well, what the hell is 700 pounds at that point? You know what I mean? Even though that's like a PR, it's like in your hands, that feeling. So I held 800. I mean, this is nothing. It's 100 pounds less. So it does a crazy amount for your mental. But, um, yeah, that 750 fails. I learned a lot from it. And um, I, I didn't touch. I got the shirt on more. I did get close, but I did not have any spring off the bottom. So I was learning through that whole process where I need my body weight first off. Because when I hit the 750 to the one board, I was around 250. Climbed up to 255. Had a lot of trouble getting down. Um, so I got my body weight back down to 250. Felt really good in that range. I fit all my shirts very well at 250. Uh, so I changed my body weight over that that course of time, dieting down. Um, and I did touch at the meet with 750. Felt like I was in the right spot. But the press up just wasn't there. I didn't have quite enough time to train in it. But I learned a lot from that lift about where I need to be body weight wise in that shirt. Uh, I still have more to learn on how to how to groove it right. And I got to work more with it. But it was all a good learning process. And that's what I want to focus on is, is the positives of it. And every time I fail, focus on the positives of it. You know, what can I take away to get better next time? And that's how you have to look at it. Don't be mad because you because you failed. And I see a lot of people, they throw a huge fit. They get angry. They, yeah. Some people leave the gym entirely. They're like, F this shit. They're done. But instead, let it fire you up and piss you off and then figure out how to fix it. Because it's a good thing. You know, handling and failing max attempts, that 700 squat, if I didn't take that, I wouldn't know how to get it better. So... That's very, very valuable. And the feeling you get from failure, the shitty feeling, the fuck everything, you know, I hate this, you know, that should inspire you not to feel like that again. Yeah. So then you try your best to be successful. Look at Tom Brady. <laughs> Got suspended. He was like, F this shit. Came back and won a Super Bowl. He lit it up. What was that year he totally lit it up? Uh, it was after something happened. It was the uh, knee injury. He was, yeah. Oh, after 2008. After 2008, knee injury. He came back. He lit it up. He was pissed. He was mad. That 55-0 to zero game against the Titans, he was mad. Yeah. He, <laughs> uh, you know, that's what great ones do. Let it fire you up. You don't dwell in it. it. fires you up. And you come out pissed. You hit that weight. Get real mad. All right. So, uh, if we're, we got any comments coming in? Nothing good to wrap up. All right. So we're going to start wrapping this baby up. So we covered a lot of great stuff today. I think a good one is uh, do what you suck at to get better. Yeah, that's a great theme. That's my motto. <laughs> Don't suck. Yeah, you find what you suck at and just do that more. That's the easy way. If you want to know the best exercise selection tool, find what you suck at and do it more. That's all. That's all it is. Another good lesson is to be honest with yourself, be able to analyze yourself. Yeah, absolutely. We had some great comments. Dave Kingwater commented in um, about that as well, and I thought that was very good as being your, be very critical of yourself, and that's hard to do, um, but understand where you're weak, and, and you always have places to improve. Everyone has somewhere to improve, even the great ones, uh, even dudes like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, you know, top of the game, they have things they can improve in, you know, so that's what makes them great. They're always looking for that next thing. I never stop critiquing someone, you know, if you're on our team. You know, granted, if you look like the best lift in the world, I'm always going to try to give you a tidbit to try to get better on, at least a focal point, because you can always get better. And then there's don't do stupid shit before your meet. Don't do stupid shit before <laughs> your meet. Yeah, we uh, there's a bun bunch of good ones that we covered today, so please share the podcast. If you know where to find us, at Big Benches on Instagram. We are also on Twitter. Okay, I've been posting up a bit on there. Um, I'm at Big Quad Tiny Arm. Had to change it up a little bit. Yep, on Twitter. 
And, uh, you know, Instagram, you can communicate with us for the bench cast. We go live, so you get your opportunity to jump on the show um, and be interactive with us. So make sure you're getting on the Instagram and then YouTube. You can find all our great bench content. And make sure you go to bigbenches.com. We got a bunch of great stuff out that you see here. We got the elbow sleeves, the wrist wraps. These 36-inch big bench and wrist wraps, um, game changers, guys, all right? going to give you a ton of support. I got videos on YouTube on how to use them. Great stiffness, perfect amount. Uh, we got the DVDs here for the bench clinic. If you want to get detailed the bench and take it from the ground up, that's how you go about starting it. We covered a warm-up, hands-on portion, different exercises, programmings that cover Q&A. Um, we have all the apparel. It's all customizable. So if you want something on the back, you want a specific color, you want a specific logo, you got it. All right. So, at Bench and Benny, you can find me on Instagram to my personal account. This is Small Arm, Legs Strong, and you've been listening to The, the Bench Cast.